Today, we will hear a review of Belt and Road, A Chinese World Order by Bruno McCase. The Wall Street Journal says that in Belt and Road, China's emerging mastery of the Eurasian trade zone is described in visionary and granular detail. Our presenter today is Abnit Rajit Badabayal, the Arthur G. Gosnell Professor of Economics at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thanks very much. Okay, so everyone can hear me? Okay, very good. Uh, I like to walk around, so you'll excuse me if something. I did. Yeah. Uh, so you'll excuse me if I like to saunter in the course of conversation. So let me begin by asking how many people have already read the book? Great. Now I can shape all your minds. <laughs> all right. So let me tell you a little bit about why I'm interested in this topic. So I am an economics professor at RIT, and I'm interested in any and everything under the sun that has something remotely to do with economics. And that includes a lot of political economy-related topics, that is, issues that affect both the politics as well as the economics of a country, or in this case, several countries. So I've written a fair amount trying to communicate with the popular media on the topic of President Trump's trade war with China, but we'll see whether we get to it. The primary purpose here is to review this particular book, so I want to begin by doing that, and then if we have time, we can talk about uh, President Trump's trade war with China, or during the Q&A, you can ask me questions about President Trump's trade war, whatever aspect you find interesting or worth discussion. I'm open to all of that, all right? Okay, so this is a pretty good book. I've read it uh, pretty carefully, and I think the book does a pretty good job of explaining clearly to, for a lay audience what the underlying issues are and what some of the implications are of China succeeding with its so-called Belt and Road Initiative. But there is one glaring problem with the book. And this glaring problem, I guess to some extent it's in the, it's in the eyes of the beholder, is that there are zero maps he talks about various regions of the world and what China is attempting to do in these different parts of the world. But unless you're already very familiar, in some cases intimately familiar, with the underlying geography, you're going to be lost in terms of what it is that he's actually talking about. So I'd like to begin the discussion by first pointing to a few maps so we can place where the topic is that is under discussion and then have something to say about what it is that the Belt and Road Initiative is actually trying to do, or Belt and Road in uh, the opinion of the author. Okay, so here we go. So all of green here is the People's Republic of China, okay, or just China. And all of these countries surrounding China are potentially members of the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. What China would like to do, as far as its claims are concerned, its avowed claims, is to resurrect, in some way, shape, or form, the old Silk Road that involved trade between what is now Mongolia and the People's Republic of China, and connect Mongolia, particularly the People's Republic of China, to Europe. That used to be a land route, the old Silk Road. So one component of what China is trying to do with its Belt and Road Initiative is to resurrect and even strengthen this original land route that existed, connecting vast portions of Asia, Central Asia, with Europe. The other part that's very, very important to remember is the C route. There is a C component to this, but before I get into the C component, I want to point out certain things that are very, very germane to understanding what the Belt and Road Initiative is actually hoping to accomplish. Okay, so two things. First, geography and neighbors. So if you look at the People's Republic of China, all of this in green, one thing that's worth pointing out is that China has disputes with many countries surrounding it. So let's begin with India and Pakistan here. So this is Pakistan, this is India. This region here is Jammu and Kashmir. There is about one third of Jammu and Kashmir, sometimes called Azad Kashmir, held by Pakistan. And the remaining two thirds, that's largely this particular portion, is held by India. And there are certain land masses here where I'm pointing my finger, that's Aksai Chin, a particular glacier, where there are disputes between India and China in terms of who actually has 
a control over that territory and who should have control over that territory. Now, Pakistan tried to muddy the waters by actually gifting some of this land that was under dispute to China. And the Indian position sometimes is, well, you can't gift something that you don't have. So that's one particular aspect of the dispute. If we go further down here, this particular region is Arunachal Pradesh in India. Again, there are border disputes between India and China here. And in fact, in 1962, India and China fought a bloody war, which re resulted in a relatively quick Chinese victory, but it nonetheless did very little to demarcate where the actual border lies as far as this state of Arunachal Pradesh is concerned. Okay? Now, we move a little north here. China's westernmost province, Xinjiang, it has a considerable amount of difficulty in Xinjiang. Why? Because Xinjiang is largely populated by ethnic Turk-speaking people, Muslims who are sometimes known as Uyghurs, some Kazakhs, some Kyrgyzstani people. It's a hodgepodge of different groups of people, most of whom are not Han Chinese. That is the dominant ethnic group in China. So these people are constantly trying to rid themselves to the extent possible of Beijing's rule far away in the east, and China is doing an excellent job of repressing the Uyghurs and creating what you might want to think of as the modern-day equivalent of Nazi concentration camps, because upwards of one million Uyghurs are in so-called re-education camps being re-educated, of course, against their will. But that's not what the Chinese propaganda typically likes to tell you, but we can get into that later, but the fact of the matter is it's westernmost province Xinjiang is where there is a lot of political unrest. Okay. Then, when we move down in this particular direction, all of you, of course, know that there is a huge dispute with Taiwan in terms of whether Taiwan is or is not a part of China and whether Taiwan does or does not have the right to go it alone as far as running its own affairs are concerned. Then, you also have here problems with Vietnam. And when I move further east here, in the South China Sea here, there are several disputes with many different countries, not the least of which is the Philippines, about who owns a bunch of shoals, coral reefs, and whether or not China has the right to do whatever it wants on these particular coral reefs and shoals. The United World Court ruled against China four years ago, but China basically said, go to hell, we'll do exactly what we want. And since the Philippines is a much smaller country and military, militarily is basically a dwarf compared to the big China's, Chinese panda bear, it's basically done, done not much other than periodic bluster from its president, Rodrigo Duterte, who loves to, you know, uh, what shall I say, be a rabble rouser in chief from time to time. Then we move up north here. Here we have Japan. And of course, there are long-standing disputes between Japan and China about various different matters, not the least of which are a speck of islands roughly here. You can't even see them, called the Senkakus, which are uninhabited. But nonetheless, Japan controls these islands, but China claims sovereignty over these islands. Okay? So what's the point? The point I'm trying to get across here is that almost Across its southern, eastern, and western border, China has territorial disputes with several countries. Okay? Many of them chafe under Chinese aggressive rule, and they would like to rid themselves to the extent possible, but of course, it's, that's easier said than done. And that's one thing that you need to understand, these territorial disputes, of which there are many, not just one. Okay? Second point that I want to emphasize is energy. The Chinese economy is growing at a very, very rapid rate, upwards of 6%. And to power this economic growth, frenzied economic growth, one of the key natural resource inputs that you need is oil, or energy more generally, oil and natural gas. So where does this energy come to from China? Where does it arrive from? Well, let's look at a map again. So this is the Middle East, okay, right here. So this is Iran. This is Iraq, this is Saudi Arabia, and then we have the United Arab Emirates right here, and of course, a lot of unrest here in Yemen in terms of a Saudi-led war, but let's not worry about that. So oil principally moves down here along the Persian Gulf, through here, the Straits of Hormuz, where there has been a lot of action recently. Then it goes all the way down the Indian Ocean, moves this way, 
passes through the so-called Straits of Malacca, which is a very tiny, narrow waterway, very heavily uh, trafficked with ships of all kinds, including oil tankers. Then it moves up here, goes through the South China Sea, and unloads its oil, natural gas, at a variety of eastern seaboard ports. So China is very sensitive to the point that if any one of these choke points, the first choke point, Strait of Hormuz, a second key choke point at the Straits of Malacca right here were to be closed off, China would be in a deep bind in terms of where to procure energy from. Of course, in principle, it's possible to take your ships and go all the way around, but that would be prohibitively costly and would not make much sense, even from a, uh, what shall I say, pure geographic transport perspective. So these are the two issues that I would like folks to keep in mind. China's extreme energy dependence, the primary source of energy dependence is here, which comes through ships, and hence there are these choke points that China is very, very concerned about, and of course, ideally would like to control. All right? Okay. Next map. So I'm deliberately presenting a relatively simplified version of the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. What I'm pointing out here is first the so-called land route, as you can see, it moves from China all the way to Urumqi. Urumqi is the capital of Xinjiang, the restive province that I mentioned. It goes through Almaty, that's Kazakhstan, Bishkek, that's Kyrgyzstan, Samarkand, that's Uzbekistan, Istanbul, that's Turkey, part goes to Moscow, but the point is you connect to Rotterdam, which is the biggest port in all of Europe. Okay? So that's the land route. And then you have the sea route, which has many different parts to it. So you have these string of Chinese ports here. All of them are connected, and you have this one particular route, as you can see, going right through the Straits of Malacca, which is what I said is a congested and heavily contested domain in terms of what would happen to China were it to lose uh, access to ships traveling through the Straits of Malacca. Then you have this part, nothing much is happening here, but here there is more activity because the Chinese basically won a 99-year lease over a Sri Lankan port called Hambantota because Sri Lanka was unable to pay back Chinese loans in a timely manner. Now that's a separate component of Belt and Road, but we'll get to it. But as you can see, the objective here is to eventually to go through the Suez Canal and then ultimately end up in Europe. Now there are other portions too, but these are the two primary aspects of the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. One, an overland route, Secondly, a maritime route, and I've tried to briefly illustrate these two components of the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay? So I think it's a good idea to have these maps in mind so you know what we're basically talking about when you look at what China's trying to do either via land or via sea. All right? Okay, let's proceed. Okay, so this is the book that we're basically reviewing here. Belt and Road, A Chinese World Order by Bruno Maceas. And as I see that there are, there are four key parts of the book. Okay? So the first part basically explains and provides some details about the Belt and Road Initiative. I don't know why it drops the word initiative, because just Belt and Road doesn't quite make as much sense, but hey, that's the author's preference. Then it talks about the Belt and Road impacts, the impacts of this initiative on the world economy, then the world politics, and then some pontification. In other words, if the Belt and Road Initiative were to succeed, what might the world look like in the future? And they talk about four different scenarios, but we'll come to that in a couple of minutes. Okay, so these are the four broad parts in which the book is organized. So first, let's look at, as Groucho Marx might tell us at the beginning, details of Belt and Road. Okay, so most Chinese will tell you that the Belt and Road Initiative is primarily an infrastructure project. It's designed to help countries and help China at the same time build up infrastructure which is sorely lacking in many different parts of the world. But of course, beyond that, it's also a global development plan. Okay? And it's sufficiently vague that at one particular point, the author, oops, the author refers to the so-called opacity of power because the Belt and Road Initiative in principle can be anything you want it to be. There are many different meanings attached to it. So even though on paper it's primarily about infrastructure and promoting development, it would be foolish to deny that there are political economic angles that China seeks to explore and attain 
with the completion of this particular uh, initiative. All right? Now, it's a very, very costly project. As you can see, something in the four to eight trillion dollar range. So just to give you a sense for how big that might actually be, does anybody have an idea of what the size of the US economy in any calendar year is, approximately? Three trillion, any others? Okay, so it's about 17 to 18 trillion dollars. And we are the largest economy in the world, and the Chinese economy is the second largest in the world. So for, a second, for the second largest economy in the world to be spending four to eight trillion dollars, you know that they have significant ambitions in terms of, of course, they're not spending everything in one year, but you know that they have significant ambitions here in terms of what they would like to do and more importantly, how they would like to shape the world, hopefully from their perspective, in their own image. So one bank alone, Export Import Bank of China, hopes to finance over a thousand projects in 49 different countries. So that's a vast project in terms of its scale and ambition. And what's important to understand is that the current Chinese president, President Xi Jinping, who's basically a dictator for life now, has made sure that even if he were to disappear for some reason that we presently cannot foresee, the Belt and Road Initiative will not disappear. Why not? Because it's been written not only into the five-year plans of the Communist Party, but also written into the Communist Party's constitution. So this is something that the Communist Party must work on, irrespective of whether President Xi himself does or does not remain around to make sure that this particular project is seen through its uh, fruition. Okay, another point, and I already alluded to this, China is trying to do a lot to make sure that it minimizes its dependence on oil, particularly oil brought in tankers and, con uh, not containers, tankers through the Straits of Malacca. So to give you an example, some people have even talked about this. So here are the Straits of Malacca, right? So what the Chinese are worried about is if we, or any other country, were to blockade the Strait of Malacca, that could really crush, energy, uh, crush China in terms of non-receipt of energy, oil and natural gas. So some of the crazier ideas has also been, so this is Thailand, okay, so this is Myanmar, and then this is Thailand. You look at this particular isthmus, at its narrowest point, the Chinese have considered building something like the Panama Canal here. So if they can succeed with the Panama Canal-like venture, then of course the ships would go right through here into the South China Sea, completely bypassing the so-called Strait of Malacca. I don't think that's gonna happen, but it has been mentioned, building a Panama-type canal to break up this narrow isthmus. There's no reason to see why Thailand would want to agree to something like this. It's completely not in the interests of Thailand to break up its particular landmass, even more so because you have Muslim unrest in Thailand in some of the southern portions here. So if you cut off some of that, because there's now a waterway here, it would be much more difficult to make sure that these people who are, you know, rightly or wrongly uh, against Thai rule, which is actually a military rule right now, are held in check. All right. Okay. So. I've already pointed to the fact that an attack or some kind of war on the Straits of Alaka would be uh, very devastating. So what China wants to do, and this is the objective of the maps that I showed, create a whole series of new pipelines that are overland, run through Central Asia, Iran, Russia, and hence there would be no dependence on tankers or maritime oil as far as energy dependence is concerned. Okay, so that's as far as details of the Belt and Road are concerned. Now, one way in which China is trying to rival the United States, and make no mistake that it is absolutely trying to rival the United States, is somewhat surreptitiously. So what it's saying is that, let me go to the map again. Okay, so there are gonna be overland oil routes here, and some of these countries, say Kazakhstan, have a reasonable amount of oil. But these countries, say Kyrgyzstan, Kargas, uh, Kazakhstan, the so-called five stands, Uzbekistan, they're heavily dependent on Chinese patronage. They're much smaller economies, much weaker than the Chinese economy. So what, Chinese are say, what the Chinese are saying, for instance, to the Kazakhs, okay, we want your oil, 
But you know what? We'll pay for it in our currency. That's the yuan, or sometimes also called the renminbi. So what does that do? It tells relatively dependent countries that yes, we want your oil, but we won't pay for it in American dollars. We're going to pay for it in Chinese yuan or Chinese renminbi. So in this way, they are trying to undercut the market for oil, which is overwhelmingly on tra all transactions are invoiced in American dollars, and then chip away at the dominance of the American dollar. Okay, so that's the point here. Most, I mean, 90 plus percent of the world's oil is typically invoiced in American dollars. No matter where you're buying and selling, it's all done in American dollars. So that's why the United States has a tremendous amount of power on the world market, but we can talk about that later. All right? Okay, Belt and Road Impacts on the World Economy. Now, the author, Bruno Maceas, several times invokes this Mandarin word, Tiangxia. And this word has several meanings. But from what I can gather, the meaning to be used is dependent on the context. But generally, it means not just looking at yourself or your immediate surroundings, but having a more holistic view to embrace not only your own nation, but also the rest of the world. So as you can see, if you subscribe to this Tiangxia philosophy, the Belt and Road Initiative makes sense because it's a worldwide project. And of course, Tiangxia suggests that you should look at the whole world's welfare, not just your own welfare. So that's one way to justify the Belt and Road Initiative, but of course, Make no mistake, the real goal of the project is to create a China-led world order, replacing the United States, if it were possible to do that. Now, in the course of doing this, that is progressing with its Belt and Road Initiative, not only in the immediate vicinity of China, that is Central Asia, but also in many other countries, it's important to not fall into what economists call the middle-income trap. So what is the middle-income trap? So as you folks know, before 1979, when Deng Xiaoping became the Chinese premier, China was a largely agrarian country with significantly less industry than it has today. So one of the things that China decided to do early on in its development path is to take on labor-intensive tasks and undertake these labor-intensive tasks as well as it possibly could. Why? Because it had a lot of labor, and hence the cost of labor is very low. And it has successfully done that for several years, but now the, its cost advantage is beginning to decline to, say, countries like Bangladesh. Why? Because economists have a theory about how wages are determined. And it's very simple in English. What it basically says is that as productivity grows, wages grow. Or if you like, wage and productivity, these two things move together. So, as productivity in China has grown, China's wages have grown. And because China's wages have grown, Chinese workers now look less attractive to foreigners sitting in Sweden or the United States or in the UK because, say, workers in Bangladesh now look a lot more attractive because their wages are much lower in the face of this development that we're seeing in China. So one part of the middle income trap is where you cannot compete globally with labor intensive products because your wages are too high. Why are your wages too high? Because you have seen productivity gains relative to a country like, say, Vietnam or Bangladesh. But the other side of the trap is that you also cannot compete in higher value-added activities because your productivity is too low. So relative to really high-tech economies, even including countries in the Southeast Asia area, such as Singapore, certainly including Germany, the United States, etc., where productivity is very high, you cannot compete because your productivity just doesn't measure up. So it is possible in principle to be caught in this pincer movement, also known as the so-called middle income trap. And the author does a good job of pointing out that this is the, something that the Chinese are not only cognizant of, but they're trying very hard to make sure that they themselves don't fall into this middle income trap. Okay? So one aspect of not falling into middle income traps is to say, you know, some of our domestic factories which are at the lower end of the productivity spectrum, that is highly labor-intensive work, say garments, textiles, things like that, we're going to ship these factories out to Central Asia and let those guys work on these particular aspects of the Chinese economy. Very low wage, low productivity. But we'll keep the higher value-added factories in China, 
But the lower, lower value added ones will actually be customers for higher value added factories that we are going to keep in China. Now, one aspect, one specific aspect of this higher value added is, well, when you're manufacturing things like lithium ion batteries, trying to make headway in the uh, uh, production of electric cars, one of the key raw materials that you need is a substance or a mineral called cobalt. There are certain others that you need also, which are found in China. These are the rare earths, but one of them is cobalt, which you don't find in China. So what China has done, because it hopes to dominate the world in electric, mar in electric cars, that's a part of its so-called Made in China 2025 venture, about which President Trump has commented a lot, as have other Western observers, is if you want to dominate the market for electric cars, you better have a steady supply of cobalt. So what China has done is enter into contracts with the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is democratic only in name, and they have all kinds of agreements with the DRC, the contents of which, the terms of which, are absolutely unknown to anybody else other than the contractual parties. So we don't know what terms have been offered, what is exactly going to be done by China to make sure that this cobalt flow keeps happening, but nonetheless, we do know that they apparently have a lock on the supply of cobalt, which is important to manufacture lithium ion batteries, which are of course used extensively in electric cars. Okay? So these are some of the impacts that we might expect to see on the world economy as far as the Belt and Road Initiative is concerned. But now we come to the more controversial part, the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative on politics. Okay? Okay, again, let me go back to the map so I can point to, all right. So some of the best developed, to date that is, Belt and Road Initiative projects are in the country of Pakistan. Okay? Because remember, what is the logic here? All of Chinese industrial activity that's occurring here, of course, goes out via ships, and there are several ports here that the Chinese have mastered in terms of the art of container, ship, construction, unloading of cargo, things of that sort. But what happens to production in the interior and as you move west. It's prohibitively costly to have to ship everything to the coast here and then ship it out. So what the Chinese would like to do, and this is part of their overland route, is ideally secure a beachhead somewhere else that they would not normally have. So what they're, what they're doing right now is working with Pakistan to create something called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, where from Xinjiang here, there are pipelines and roads that go all the way south here. And where I have my forefinger right now, they're in the process of developing a major container uh, uh, port called Gwadar, G-W-A-D-A-R. Until a few years ago, Gwadar used to be just a fishing village and nothing else. And it's been transformed pretty dramatically, almost entirely because of Chinese initiatives as a part of its so-called Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Okay? Now, but the thing to note is that although pipelines, roads, etc., are flowing in this direction, this part of Pakistan is known as Balochistan. And many Balochis are actually opposed to Pakistani rule because when the country was formed in 1947, the British paid no attention to what the Balochis thought, said, well, to hell with them, they'll just come along. But that's not, of course, how the Balochis felt. So there are sporadic attacks on pipelines, roads, things of that sort by Balochi nationalists. And so there's a security aspect associated with this particular initiative in Pakistan. And of course, as you can imagine, India is not particularly thrilled because what India sees is China gradually attempting to encircle India through a whole series of maritime ports. So if this succeeds, they'll have a port in Gwadar here, which they claim is only for civilian use, but who knows what will happen over time. So one port here, they already have a 99-year lease on a port in Sri Lanka, which the, because the Sri Lankans were unable to pay off the debt payments in a timely manner to China, so China just basically took the port, and now there may be military activity here as well. So you have one port here, you have another port here, and here is the east coast of Africa. In Djibouti, they actually have a military base right now. So many countries are concerned that when you look at what China is trying to do, it's trying to 
project power in seas where it has traditionally been absent, and I'm referring to the Indian Ocean here, and thereby acting as a deterrent and even a threat to many other countries, such as India, who never thought that something like this was in the offing. Okay? So that's one part. Problems with India, in part because of disputed territory, but also because of what the Chinese are actually attempting to do by building this particular deep sea water port in Wadar. Okay, so where were we? Okay, so to negate some of this, or to actually to counterman some of this, a band of countries, India, Australia, led on by us, that is the United States and Japan, are attempting to construct their own infrastructure projects, giving soft loans to countries, in part to combat the Belt and Road Initiative. And what we, that is in the United States, are trying to do is to get India to play a substantially bigger role, that's the free and open order, referred to on page 125, in what uh, uh, Pentagon planners call the Indo-Pacific region, to counter the Belt and Road Initiative. Because the two great heavyweights in Asia right now are China and India, the Chinese economy is stronger than the Indian one. Militarily, China is also stronger than India. But what we don't know is what's going to happen in the future. The big draw for India, for the United States, is, is that it's a democracy. It's not a one-party police state where the dictator decides what happens, and if the dictator doesn't like your face, you could be, end up in the slammer. Okay. That doesn't happen in, in India. So we would like India to play a much bigger role than it already is, in part to counterman the effects of the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. But time will tell to what extent India can come up and play this particular role, because you have Indian politics to deal with, which is not always aligned very well with what the US would like India to do. Now, moving to the European Union, that's the European Union, many European Union players have said that if the EU cannot come up with a single strategy with which to confront China, China will have, success, will have been successful in basically dividing Europe. Why? Because what China is doing is looking at the weaker members of the European Union, say the former Czech, well not former, current Czech Republic, Hungary, which already have authoritarian instincts right now. I mean, Hungary is led right now by a relatively authoritarian person, and trying to curry favor with these countries by giving them soft loans, concessional projects, things of that sort. So you often have a scenario where the EU is throttled in its own decision making because rightly or wrongly, the EU has decided all major decisions must be taken by consensus. So in a 28 group country, even if one country opposes, nothing happens. And the Chinese are exploiting this very, very skillfully. And this is just one particular point. In a recent, a relatively recent summit in May 2017, no joint trade statement would be signed by the European Union because it appeared to European Union that China, despite protestations to the contrary, was explicitly favoring firms in its own country as far as the award of contracts is concerned. Okay. So the Belt and Road Initiative is causing a significant amount of angst, not only for us here in the United States, but also in Asia, as well as in European Union. Because no one really knows what China's intentions are, and many worry that they're not quite what they say they are. Right? Okay, last part of the book, pontification. So, from the Chinese perspective, the Belt and Road Initiative, if it is successful, and of course we have to wait, the jury is out on that particular aspect, will have successfully reversed what they call a century of humiliation. Now, I can go into a century of humiliation in greater detail, but I'll just say the following to give you a sense for what's happening. The first opium war was fought between the Qing dynasty in China and the British in 1846. The Chinese were hammered and, uh, and had to basically sign very, very humiliating treaties, giving up a lot of what was very dear to them. Since then, they have lost wars to the French, to the Japanese, the Second Opium War, uh, the uh, British invaded Tibet. So they've had all kinds of military losses to confront uh, themselves with over a period of roughly 100 years. And this is something every school child in China hears of. Of course, there's a nice propaganda element to it also, that we have been humiliated by foreigners for over 100 years. Now it is our time in the sun, and by golly, we're not going to let them humiliate the, us again. 
Okay? So, what are the possible scenarios that we might see in a post Belt and Road Initiative? Of course, assuming that the initiative succeeds. So, scenario one is where China essentially plays the role of the former West Germany and Japan now. Meaning what? Well, it becomes rich and successful, it converges to a Western political and social model, but it has no hegemonic ambitions. It does not try to replace the United States as the world leader in both economics and politics broadly construed. The second possibility is where scenario one holds. In other words, China is still very prosperous and successful, but now it's not playing the role of a West Germany or Japan. It actively seeks to remove the United States from the center of the world system, and the world center would now be in Beijing if scenario two were to prevail. Scenario three, in many ways the nightmare scenario, a clash between China and the United States, where the United States loses, China moves to the center of global power, and a China-led world basically dominates all activities pretty much anywhere you, you choose to uh, mention or talk about. And scenario four is where the world fractures into two opposing, and here's the important part, irreconcilable visions. So, to some extent, like the Cold War days, when you had the Soviet Union and you had the United States, you had a bipolar world, and essentially speaking, the objectives, the goals of these two groups of countries were irreconcilable. Something like that, where the world fractures into two opposing and irreconcilable uh, visions, one led by China and the other led by the United States. You're already seeing the beginnings of that in a very particular context. And that particular context is the Trump administration's decision to basically term Huawei, the Chinese uh, telecom manufacturer as persona non grata. So Huawei has absolutely no access, well, maybe not absolutely, almost no access to Western technology. So Huawei makes smartphones, amongst other things. They also have many great advances in 5G technology. But in the case of smartphones, just think about it. If you don't have an Apple phone and if you have an Android phone, you take for granted that the operating system that your phone is going to run on is Android, which is generally freely available, but produced by Google. But now, except for the free versions of Android, which basically are the elementary bones with which you can construct anything you want, the more sophisticated versions, which are proprietary, Huawei will not have access to. That means they're going to have phones with their own operating system, no Google Maps, no Google Chrome. How many people do you think will buy that kind of phone? Or at least not, not very many in the short run. In the long run, if they're able to convince consumers that, hey, our phones are as good as any produced by Google or Samsung or Apple, then maybe people will come into the market. But this is one specific area where you're beginning to see the early parts of a fracturing. Maybe there'll be a China-led telecoms and smartphone industry in one part of the world and a US-led uh, uh, smartphone and telecoms industry in another part, and they both simultaneously coexist. But of course, there is very little conversation between these two fractured uh, visions of the world. So I'd like to close there and you know, take questions from you folks about any of this or, uh, like I said, uh, President Trump's trade war.